He was so good as to give me half of what he purchased, instructing me to pack up the other half for the empress. He then threw himself on a hard bed, telling me to let him know as soon as the sledge was ready. While the emperor rested, I hurried up the repairs to the sledge and occupied myself with the continuation of my notes from the time we left Pazin. All the emperor's remarks showed that his mind was continually occupied with the army, and then he persisted in believing it could be rallied at Vilna. His opinion did not change. He made all his arrangements and based all his plans on this presumption. The bad effect of our disasters will be balanced in Europe on my return to Paris, he said. The consolation afforded by reflections such as these made our journey a happy one. The nearer we got to France, where all his hopes were centered, the less did the emperor seem preoccupied and careworn. Schwarzenberg is a man of honor, he said. He will keep his court in readiness. He has no wish to become a traitor. At the first moment, fortune turns her back on us. The Prussians will model their conduct on that of the Austrians. I shall be at the Tuileries before anyone knows of my disaster or dares to betray me. My cohorts make an army of more than 100,000 men, well-disciplined soldiers led by war-trained officers. I have the money and arms to form excellent cadres. And before three months have passed, I shall have conscripts and 500,000 men under arms on the banks of the Rhine. The cavalry will take the longest to collect and form, but in the coffers of the Tuileries, I have the wherewithal to do everything. The further we went, the more snow we found. The gales that had been blowing continuously for some days had caused such drifts in several places that the difficulties of the road made our progress too slow, even for the liking of our phlegmatic Saxon postilions and horses. The emperor often spoke of the effect that would be produced by his return. The nation needs me, he said. If it responds to my attentions, all will soon be put right. The news from Paris did not make him forget the army. He was more certain than ever than it would hold Vilna and based all his calculations on this hypothesis. For my own part, I reckoned aloud the days it would occupy in its retreat as far as Vistula at least without arousing the emperor's annoyance. You see the black side of everything. You are not encouraging, was his remark. What I had observed in the Duchy of Poland left me with no doubts as to the abandoning of Vilna. If there are no Polish Cossacks, there can be no rest for your army, I said to the emperor, who agreed that this shortage of cavalry somewhat changed the situation. He would not, however, admit the necessity for evacuating Vilna. He enumerated his forces from the Prince of Schwarzenberg's corps to that of the Duke of Toronto and was no doubt justified in thinking that numerically he had more men than were necessary to stop the Russians, provided that every one of them had done his duty. He thought that the sense of discouragement in the army had been allayed as soon as they got in touch with the stores at Vilna, and he tried to persuade himself that the levies were already raised, or at least were being collected while we were on our way to Paris. To hear him, one might have imagined that no more need to be done, but march them from the barracks to the frontier, not admitting the need for the evacuation of Lithuania. He also refused to admit the existence of those almost insurmountable obstacles which the near approach of the enemy and the fear of invasion would place in the way of raising the levies. Thus the emperor journeyed on towards his capital, cherishing illusions such as these, and in no way put out with me for sharing in them. As was natural, our conversation continually reverted to the army, to politics, to the administration, to men we knew, to various institutions, to what he would do to better these, and to his son. He asked me once more who could be entrusted with his education, and added that France, so rich in talent, was yet poor in superior men when it came to making a choice like that. Are you not hard put to it, Calancourt, to name a single one to make a choice, even from amongst all the people we have discussed? Fontaine, he said, is too much the man of letters, since he is head of the university. That choice should be pleasing, the more so because he directs public instruction in the right spirit. 
Though distinguished for his great gift of eloquence, he is not gifted with great ideas. With the broad grasp of politics and administration, it constitutes a statement. Besides, he has extolled me so highly that the public would not fail to say that I was setting my most confirmed flatterer to be the preceptor for my son. He asked me to look about for a tutor. He passed in review nearly all the men in official position or at court, even those of little prominence. The way he spoke of several confirmed in me more than ever the belief that, in general, he had put but a poor opinion of mankind. It seems to me that this explains the absence of any animosity towards various persons who had done him real injury. He had every reason to heap reproaches on them, but he contented himself with dismissing them at once and not saying a word. He seemed to place great value on the delicacy of mind and honorable sentiments inculcated by good training in early years. It corrects the most vicious traits in a man's character. I have heard him say more than once, the man who has not been well brought up has a certain uncouthness, a basis of egotism that makes it difficult to rely on him. Self-interest is his only criterion. He lacks a sense of restraint and this makes him prone to do anything. He mentioned several notable men whom he employed in his very responsible situations, adding that he did not trust them, that they were capable of betraying him at the first opportunity when they considered it in their interest to do so, although they owed everything to him. According to the emperor, the binding nature of an oath, fidelity in the execution of the functions or service in which one is employed, the sense of honor, that makes it impossible to betray the man one serves meant nothing to these men. Religion and fidelity were sentiments wholly lacking in their natures. Even patriotism, he went on, is a word that conveys nothing to them if it is not consonant with their own interests. When certain people meet with the slightest disappointment, such as the refusal of a post they have requested for some rascal who happens to be a relation, they turn against me. Some are even ready to plot against me if I put stop to their peculations and open pillage. In this connection, the emperor mentioned certain names so prominent that I dare not commit them to writing. I have no wish to tarnish the glory of these names, which will go down in history. But these men, the emperor added, are heroes nonetheless. He concluded these reflections by observing that some people were wrong in complaining that he did not fill up all the appointments in his gift, not wishing to exclude any who might claim preferment by right of their eminent services. He chose rather to leave the whole question to be solved by time, which would settle many things. By then, he said, the children will be well educated and will make their start in life at a period of peace and calm. They will not have their fortunes to make, and I will give them the recompense earned by the good services of their fathers. This conversation led the emperor to speak of various episodes in his life. It was with the pleasure that he recalled some of the incidents of his youthful days. His success at the military academy, his family, which had met with so little favor from fortune, though of distinguished rank in Corsica, he spoke of various affairs of gallantry, of the preference that some society women had shown him above that granted to comrades who were at that time more conspicuous than himself. The reading of history, he said, very soon made me feel that I was capable of achieving as much as the men who are placed in the highest ranks of our annals, though I had no goal before me, and though my hopes went no further than my promotion to general, all my attention was fixed upon the great art of warfare and on increasing my knowledge of that branch in which I believed to be my destiny to lie. I was not long in discovering that the knowledge I had set out to acquire and had hitherto regarded as the end I needed to attain was very far short of the distance to which my abilities might carry me. So I redoubled my application what seemed to present difficulty to others, to me appeared to be simple.